Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Russian troops continue to advance in Ukraine. They're now encroaching on the capital city of Kiev. Credible reports also indicate that Russian soldiers are holding hostage the staff of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Critics say President Biden's sanctions on Russia aren't tough enough. People in Ukraine's capital of Kyiv woke to gunfire in several areas today as Russian forces pushed deeper into the country. The outskirts of Kyiv felt the brunt of the aggression after unleashing airstrikes on cities and military bases. Intelligence wars of Russian spies and saboteurs near Kyiv. Every day, people have been forced to hide in subway tunnels from missile strikes, now targeting residential buildings. The city of Kyiv is home to more than 2.8 million people. Many have become journalists on the ground, using cell phones to capture the first images of war. <laughs> Russian troops have entered from the north, east, and south. The president of Ukraine says Kyiv is the main target. Ukraine's president urging citizens to stand and fight. Russian forces have also taken over many strategic positions, including the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. We are outraged by credi credible reports that Russian soldiers are currently holding the staff of the Chernobyl facilities hostage. President Biden and U.S. allies responding to Russia's invasion with sanctions. Today, I'm authorizing additional strong sanctions and new limitations on what can be exported to Russia. This is going to impose severe cost on the Russian economy, both immediately and over time. Critics, including Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, says those sanctions are not enough. Sir, sanctions clearly have not been enough to deter Vladimir Putin to this point. What is going to stop him? No one expected the sanctions to prevent anything from happening. The administration had argued the threat of sanctions was designed to stop an invasion. And they say more sanctions are needed now. Putin also raised another threat, that Russia might use nuclear weapons if anyone tried to use military action to stop its takeover of Ukraine. And Putin may have more on his mind than just Ukraine. The president was asked today, what if this goes beyond Ukraine? And he said, if Putin moves into NATO countries, we will be involved. He, he said, we will be involved. Is this a possibility? Is it a possibility that Putin goes beyond Ukraine? Sure, it's a possibility. Like many international analysts, the president says capturing Ukraine is not his ultimate endgame. He has much larger ambitions in Ukraine. He wants to, in fact, reestablish the former Soviet Union. That's what this is about. A lot of fast-moving developments overnight and this morning. The head of Ukraine's armed forces announcing in the last few hours, today Ukraine needs everything. All procedures for joining are simplified. All you need is a passport or an ID. And, quotes, there are no age restrictions. I have to say today the city is more on edge than ever before. We've seen firefights breaking out inside the city. And there are reports that the police and the military are just handing out weapons to civilians. 
and I have to say the city is now braced for what looks like the battle for Kyiv. Overnight, Russian forces closing in on Kyiv, explosions rocking the capital city. Images like this one circulating on social media. This morning, Ukrainian military police in full combat gear joining the fight to defend the city. The emergency services called into action after shelling overnight. Ukrainian President Zelensky in another urgent address to his country, <inaudible> saying saboteurs have already entered the capital and that Russia's named him target number one, his family target number two. They're now in hiding. Just 60 miles north of Kyiv, after fierce fighting, Russian forces reportedly now in control of Chernobyl, the destroyed nuclear power plant. From our position in Kyiv, we could see fighter jets overhead, with the city triggering its emergency air raid alarm. And just 20 miles away, Russian special forces in helicopters landing at a military base, which has been the scene of intense firefights. Videos posted on social media from inside Ukraine show these attacks unfolding as the Ukrainians mount a stiff defense. But the Russian onslaught is widespread, with missile strikes in the west. Ukrainian air bases aflame in the east, and fighter jets dropping bombs in the south, and clashes in the southern city of Sumy. The fighting on the ground has been intense. The Ukrainian president saying 137 Ukrainians have died. Ukrainian forces have been doing all they can to repel the more powerful Russian troops. But so far, sources telling ABC that not all of those 150,000 Russian troops on Ukraine's borders have crossed into the country. Russian state media is showing these troops in the east. The Ukrainian military is now in the fight of its life. President Zelensky has now ordered a general mobilization, calling up men of fighting age and reservists. In the initial assault, Russia launching over 100. 60 ballistic missiles at Ukrainian military targets. Some civilian areas were reportedly struck. The risk to civilians caught in the crossfire is extreme, with ordnance being fired almost at will by both sides. Those living in Ukraine now forced to deal with the reality of war unfolding around them. As bombs strike nearby, people are forced underground, turning subways into makeshift bomb shelters. And as Russian troops close in on the capital, thousands fleeing the city for safety, causing gridlock on major highways. Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov saying this morning that they're ready for negotiations, but after Ukrainian troops surrender. And of course, right now, there is no sign of that. And I have to say, George, we're now entering the most dangerous hour so far in this war. Ambassador Danny Danon, thanks for joining us uh, here on Jerusalem Dateline. What a day in history right now. Russia has invaded Ukraine. Uh, what's your reaction? Well, it is very unfortunate, you know, when, when you look back at the date when the UN was actually established to prevent the very scene that we saw in the last few hours uh, after the Second World War. We all believe that that will be the last time you will see nations in Europe uh, fighting uh, one each other. Uh, th that's unfortunate. Uh, and we are worried about it because, uh, you know, not only about the devastation of the Ukrainian people, but what uh, will happen in other regions, whether it will be in, in Taiwan and China relationship, uh, Iran-Israel, and uh, by the time that everybody is focusing uh, on Ukraine and Russia, the Iranians are continuing. Uh, to build their nuclear capabilities. That's right. We seem to have three hotspots or potential hotspots. Certainly, Ukraine and Russia are at war right now, but Taiwan and China is a flashpoint, and Iran is uh, is on its way to a nuclear weapon. Do you see that as a potential uh, time when the Islamic Republic might take advantage of this uh, this uh, focus of the world attention on Ukraine and Russia? So first, they are already taking advantage because they. You know, I know you follow very carefully the talks in Vienna and the agreement that they are supposed to sign in the near future. Uh, basically, it's a bad agreement. It allows Iran to continue with their ambitions uh, and basically it gives them the legitimacy to continue uh, with their ambitions to acquire nuclear capabilities. And I think the lesson for Israel after what we see in the last few hours at the UN Security Council that we have to count only on ourselves. You know, just imagine what will happen if the Iranians will decide to attack Israel. That's why we have to invest in our military, in our technology, and to make it clear that we, we have the capability, the determination to protect ourselves 
from the aggression coming from Tehran. You were there for years in the UN, uh, spoke at the UN Security Council as representative for uh, Israel. How would you describe what's going on there diplomatically right now at the United Nations? So it's very interesting because the Security Council uh, met already and I'm sure they will have uh, more deliberation in the next few days, but they will not be able to take any decisions because uh, Russia and China, uh, both of them hold the veto power and they will not allow any condemnation or any resolution to pass in the Security Council. So I think basically we will see more debates coming uh, from the UN, but the, the decisions uh, will come from the leadership of the Western democracies. They will have to be the one who will decide about the sanctions uh, and not the UN itself. And ironically, Russia seems to be the chair right now of the UN Security Council. Uh, also, Israel seems to have taken a position to support uh, Ukraine, at least partially. How would you describe how uh, Israel has responded so far and what should they do going forward? So we hope like uh, the rest of the world for a diplomatic solution. Uh, and we believe that is the, the, the only way uh, to resolve the conflict. Uh, and it's unfortunate to see what happened uh, in the last few hours, the attacks on, on Ukraine. Uh, I think that's the, the message that you heard coming from uh, Jerusalem. You know, in the past, we always... Uh, had the sensitivity because we have uh, interest with both countries, with Russia and Ukraine. But you know, when, when you see act of, of aggression, you have to take the right side. Yeah, you know, the, uh, it seems like the foreign minister of uh, Russia, Russia has come out against the uh, not recognizing uh, Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Uh, how would you uh, explain or uh, address that, that kind of uh, reaction by the Russians? So actually, I don't think it is connected to what's happening in Europe. You know, I have heard those uh, voices coming from Russia for, for years. They always supported the other side, supported the Syrians, supported the, the Palestinians on many resolutions in the Security Council. And, and when I, we had discussions about what, the way we should vote regarding the issues that they brought up, I told, listen, uh, until they don't change the way they vote about Israel, we should not uh, support them. So I don't think it's new. I think that's the policy of Russia for generations. Final question, uh, Ambassador. How do you see this affecting uh, the region here in the Middle East? Well, I, I think, you know, it, it uh, actually it gives a, a lot of strength uh, and, in, and force to the evil forces in the region. You know, when you see uh, aggression uh, all over the world, you know, it actually allows the, the radicals in the region to think about uh, more aggression, and more violence. That's why I hope and pray that uh, this conflict will end uh, sooner than we expect. I'm joined today by Jeff Kinley. Jeff, how you doing? Doing great, Billy. Good to be with you again. Well, good to have you. You are obviously a celebrated author. How many books have you written? Oh, it's in the upper 30s. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's 30, it pl it's 30 plus. The reason I bring that up is because of all the people out there who write on a variety of issues, and you've written on a, on a lot of issues, but prophecy is a big area of focus for you. You've done some amazing work in this arena, and right now the world is watching Russia. They're watching Ukraine, and I think a lot of people are wondering in the back of their mind, huh, what is going on here and so what, what do you make of this Russia situation? What's your, what's your take from a, from a prophecy perspective? Yeah, what's very interesting is that, you know, here we are, we're hopefully kind of coming out of the COVID chaos crisis era that we've been in, but who knows? But that got the world thinking because, you know, at no time in my lifetime was the whole planet talking about one thing. And so we've sort of been in an upheaval. Uh, it's almost like the, these, you know, geopolitical tectonic plates are shifting all over the world. And so while on the one hand, there's calls for global unity, now we got Russia coming in and once again, trying to divide the world by invading Ukraine. So yeah, it's got people thinking, it's got people wondering, you know, does the Bible really say anything about this? And of course, Jesus in Matthew 24, when he's talking about the latter days, the, the end times, the time of tribulation, talks about there'll be wars, rumors of wars, a nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. I don't think that's what he's talking about in this particular case, but but it certainly is a prelude or a preview, if you will, of sort of the warm up act for things that are going to happen later on. Yeah, no, and and that's you know so well said. I know one of the big things, one of the big questions is, okay, well, where do people find Russia? 
in scripture. So let's start there. Is Russia in scripture? And then let's talk about Ezekiel, because I know that's where you're going to go um, from here. But, but take us through that. Why Russia? Yeah, well, from a biblical perspective, anytime you have directions given in the Bible, then you always start with Israel being kind of the, the center or the navel, if you will, the, the center of the compass. And it speaks about nations, these nations coming from the uttermost parts of the north. And of course, if you just do a straight line north of Israel, you're going to land in the middle of Russia. And so that's one reason. Another is because the word Rosh is used in Ezekiel chapter 38. And of course, there's different opinions uh, as to what that means. But the most, I think the most plausible explanation is that it just simply refers to Russia because it's referring geographically to it and even the name itself. Um, when you get down to like to a Magog, you know, it says there'll be this war of Gog and Magog. Uh, I know that Josephus, the Jewish historian, identified that area as the area of the Scythians where they lived, which is really modern day uh, Russia. Uh, it really includes the Ukraine or includes Ukraine rather. And uh, so really you've got Rosh is Russia and part of Russia being uh, Magog. And all that just really fits. And most scholars today, Billy, uh, are pretty united on the fact that Magog does include uh, Russia and at least uh, parts of the former Soviet Union. Yeah, and that portion of Ezekiel, when you look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, this idea of Gog from Magog, Gog would, would then be a world leader, well, a world leader, really the leader of Russia in this case, essentially pending Russia is yeah. Magog. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. So the word Gog just simply means uh, chief or ruler or head. He's the kind of the top dog of the um, of the organization, if you will. And so, yeah, he would be uh, identified as the leader. So it's interesting. And, and as you said, the directions, I mean, it's very clear in Ezekiel that this is a nation to the north, right? Now, some people, there are, there are all different perspectives on this. And obviously, just right before this in Ezekiel is the conversation in scripture, one of the many of Israel basically coming back to fruition of having you know, the Hebrew people spread throughout the world then coming back and having this, what seems like it, it's describing a period of um, success, right? And no famine and all of that. You know, so right. the idea is that is that the first part there, the Israel part, and I want you to correct any pieces of this or fill in any blanks, but the Israel part would have been fulfilled in 1948, let's say, and, and since then. But this invasion part that we're talking about, the nation to the north, would have not been fulfilled, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and chronologically speaking, in order to have an invasion of Israel, you have to have an Israel. So yes, Israel became a nation again after almost 20 centuries being scattered to 70 countries. Their language was dead. It's really the miracle of miracles in the end times. And that's what Ezekiel 36 and 37 talk about, is that God's going to bring his people back together again. And of course, as you know, over 6 million Jews, over half of the Jews in the world now live in Israel. So then you get to Ezekiel 38, and now you've got this coalition of nations. You've got uh, Rosh and uh, you know Gog, the, the prince of Rosh, and, and Magog, and then these this list of other nations that, ironically enough, uh, turn out to be uh, Islamic nations uh, that are surrounding Israel. That uh, many of them have uh, have vowed to annihilate Israel off the map. And it says those nations are going to come together with a coalition with Russia, and they're going to come against Israel. They're going to seek an invasion. But as it says, uh, Israel will be prospering at that time. And I think one of the key phrases that we see in that passage, it's mentioned twice uh, in uh, verse, uh, verse 8, verse 14, is that Israel is living securely in the land when this actual invasion takes place. So, you know, by all estimation, Israel is not necessarily living securely. So it says that there are, there are cities of unwalled villages. I don't really see that happening right now, but, um, but certainly there is a, a ramping up to that happening. Yeah. And so that that's really interesting because there are some who will look at all of this and they'll say, oh, no, both of those events that already all happened a long time ago. Right. That's that is this this other perspective on this. What would you say to those people who would say, oh, no, you know, th th it's not talking about 1948 and it's not talking about some future event when it comes to Gog from Magog. It's talking about something that happened thousands of years ago already. Yeah, I think the simple answer would just be that as you look through the rest of Scripture, you, you see zero examples of that mentioned. In other words, you would think that a victory that great against that many nations with such a supernatural deliverance that God promises in, in four different ways that he gives Israel would somehow be mentioned in some of the Jewish scriptures or in some of the apocryphal uh, writings uh, or in just in secular historical documents. We have none of those. 
And so that's one reason why we see that uh, that it's going to happen uh, in the end times. The other reason is because twice, again, in this passage, it mentions the latter days. It actually says that in the latter years and the last days is that when this attack will uh, will happen. So for those two reasons, I would say not nah, it's probably still a future event. OK, so, you know, as we as we look at, you know, all the different pieces of this and we look at what's happening in the world today, one of the nations that are you know going to be part of the coalition with Magog, the first one listed, I believe, is Persia. Now, Persia is modern day Iran. So when you look at that, what are some of the events and the things that are happening right now today that sort of make you make your eyebrows raise a little bit in light of what is written there? Well, again, you would think that uh, if the Bible were not true, that all of these Islamic nations would sort of be, you know, living peacefully with Israel and everything would be fine. And there'd be no, you know, rockets, you know, fired in uh, to Israel from the Gaza Strip. I think there were over like 4,000 rockets last April uh, in one month that was fired in that. you think they'd be living in relative peace. But the Bible says that there's going to be growing tension between those nations and and again, many of these these national leaders have called for the annihilation of Israel. They want to drive them into the Mediterranean, uh, wipe them off the map. And indeed, that's one of the motivations that these nations in Ezekiel 38 will have. They want to come in, I believe, and just take Israel out. Of course, they want the complete control of the Temple Mount. Uh, I'm, there are oil reserves, that they, gas reserves that they've discovered in the Golan Heights, among other uh, gas and oil reserves in Israel that, that are yet untapped that these nations, they want control of that. And then, of course, they just hate the Jews. It's an ancient hatred that goes back thousands of years, and uh, there's no uh, no sight, no, no visual sight that we're going to see in the near future is going to take that away. They're going to continue to ramp up that, that seething hostility. Yeah, so that's why, you know, when we look at these events and they're mm-hmm. happening, it is fascinating to look at the very countries that this is not something new that you just started talking about. This is something you've talked about for a long time. For decades, we've had evangelicals and Christians talking about Russia and before that, the USSR talking about Iran and, t- you know, all of these nations have been part of this conversation. It is really strange. You know, if, if I were an atheist, I'd be looking at this and saying, okay, it's a little weird that all these things that Ezekiel, all these places that he's talking about, you know, uh, thousands of years later are the yeah. places that are not just like the random events. These, this is the centerpiece of what we are talking about right now globally. No, it really is. And, you know, like you said, 2,500 years ago, I mean, did Ezekiel just get lucky? No, I, I think he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And and now with Putin, you've got a leader. You know, people say, well, could Putin be this Gog, this this chief, this ruler of of Magog, this uh, Prince of Roche, if you will. And uh, it's certainly possible that, that depending on when all these other prophecies will be fulfilled, it's possible he'll be that. Now, he's, he's obviously the, the, the local thug. He's the bully on the block. Uh, but he's also very calculated and intentional. What's really interesting, Billy, is you see, as you look at this situation here, you know, Hitler did some similar things right prior to World War II when he uh, annexed uh, Austria and then he began invading, invading Poland. Well, Putin's really been the same thing. 2004, uh, he annexed uh, Crimea w- without hardly a shot fired. And now he's moving in like Hitler did with Poland uh, to with more military force. And so it's almost like he's Hitler 2.0. You know, he's coming in there and modeling himself after uh, this uh, world takeover. And of course, it's been many, many decades since that happened. So sometimes people have a short memory. But whether he is the Gog of, of Ezekiel 38 or as Mark Hitchcock says, he's more Gog-esque. You know, he could be just someone who's setting up Russia uh, to position them uh, to be able to, to make that invasion at a future date. And another ruler in Russia comes in. We don't really know. Okay, so last question for you. In light of just this this conversation, this is a big, broad conversation. People have a lot of different opinions on it when it comes to the end times. And some people will say, oh, you shouldn't focus on it at all. We don't need this. This isn't a huge part of where our focus should be as believers. But why is it important that as Christians, we understand prophecy? Again, we might not solve it all or know every in and out of it, but why should we be aware of it and talking about it? Well, that's a great question, a very important question for where, when we're living right now. But in the first century, you know, the early church, they were also well versed in Bible prophecy. And when you read like Second Thessalonians chapter two, Paul wrote that letter to them because there was so much confusion in the air. There were false teachers that they were coming in, uh, if you will. They were sort of writing books and doing broadcasts, you know, based on 
these nefarious views about Bible prophecy. And, and so the believers there, it says they were disturbed and shaken in their faith because they didn't know what to believe. Well, when believers today look at you know the COVID thing that we're going through, the, the push towards global governance, and then you've got now this thing that could really explode. It could be a powder keg, depending on how we as, as a nation, how England, how other nations respond to Russia and how Russia responds back to that. It could blow up in a huge powder keg. So all that to say is got people looking around the world saying, what should we do? And just like Paul told the Thessalonians uh, in his first letter and his second letter, he says, look, I want you to know what's going to happen. I want you to know what's going on. I want you to have clarity. I want you to have confidence. And I want you to have hope. And it's very important that we do that because we get many messages that come into believers. So I just want to point people back to the Word of God and uh, to seek out some trusted guides that can help you kind of navigate uh, this really foggy maze uh, that is the world that we're living in right now. But Bible prophecy does that for us. It gives us history in advance. And as I said, it, most of all, it gives us hope. And it leads us to a place of knowing that our God has not only the whole world under control, even though there are things happening, but he also has our lives in his hands as well. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zechariah goes on to tell us in verse 6, that God will use the Israeli defense forces to destroy the Muslim nations that seek their destruction. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. The Bible tells us there are three possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9, in that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. A long forgotten prophecy that has recently been rediscovered by Bill Salas may enlighten us about the fate of Iran's current nuclear aspirations as we read in Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow, which might imply that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps will be unable to launch scores of its missiles at its enemies. Additionally, he declares that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Bushehr nuclear reactor, located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah continues in verses 36 and 37. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them, until I have consumed them. Jeremiah informs that the attack upon the ancient territory of Elam will produce numerous refugees, perhaps even turning into a humanitarian crisis. Exiles will be dispersed worldwide as if being blown about by overpowering winds. In addition to the Lord, Iran has enemies in this prophecy. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Additionally, Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. 
Perhaps the salutes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. Jeremiah's last two verses present the exiles of Jeremiah 49:36 with great news. I will set my throne in Elam, and will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. Iranians who accept Christ in advance of his second coming will be returned from global exile into the restored fortunes of their historic homeland in Elam. Moreover, Jerusalem and Elam are the only two earthly locations identified in scripture for the future establishment of the Lord's throne. As we get closer to the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will reveal to students of Bible prophecy the relevance of additional overlooked prophecies concerning the end times. Is the prophecy of Elam one of those prophecies? Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, Stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. 
is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for not recognizing the signs of his first coming as we read in Matthew 16, 1-3. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. The religious leaders of Jesus' day had full knowledge of the prophecies of the Messiah. Yet these religious leaders ignored the signs and still rejected him. If the religious leaders of Jesus' day missed the signs of Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to pay close attention to the signs of Jesus' second coming? The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised them from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does His kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. 
The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Hey guys, there's a brother in Christ who has a website called ithasbeenwritten.com. Ithasbeenwritten.com is a fountain of information for the believer and unbeliever alike. Link is in the description box and in my pinned comment below.